So this is a kind of a new experiment. We're going to do a three-way conversation. Um, Tim, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Um, what, what do you do and what are your interests? I'm a curious human being, first and foremost, and that has led me to write a huge number of books, 35 I think now, exploring the different spiritual traditions of the world, uh, really looking for their commonality, where, they, where underneath the difference they seem to be addressing a common human experience of what could be called awakening. And that then led me to write what became a international bestseller, so that kind of changed my journey um, on Gnosticism, the Jesus Mysteries and then Jesus and the Lost Goddess. And then the last 20 years since then really has been about trying to integrate this, my own experience of the world, this spiritual wisdom and the modern culture of scientific understanding into one philosophical understanding and then to put that aside, something which can give people the actual experience of awakening now. So it's not only an idea, it's an experience. There's a few things that you talked about and that you've written about that are now getting a lot more attention, it seems. There's a kind of weave, the whole idea of rebel, wis rebel wisdom is that we are um, trying to kind of understand, explain and contextualise what seems to be quite a big intellectual awakening that's going on online. Yeah. The whole manifestation of long-form content, long-form YouTube videos has led to what a lot of people have kind of recognised as a real desire for knowledge and a kind of, yeah, an intellectual awakening. And part of that clearly is the sort of Jordan Peterson phenomena, the intellectual dark web phenomena, and tied into that is a new interest in Christianity, uh, a new interest in Gnosticism, and it, as well, there is, with Jordan Peterson's kind of re framing of the of the Christian story in psychological terms and there's a real there's a real interest in the religious and the sacred again after a long time of the kind of new atheist types like Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris of kind of they felt to me like they had a bit of a stranglehold on the culture this sort of radical scientific skepticism so how does it feel to you what do you make of that hurrah <laughs> I mean it, it, look I, I have a I, I had a lot of time for Richard Dawkins and people like that because I think what they were doing is they were still fighting the Enlightenment battle, which everyone, well, I thought had been won. Turned out it hadn't been won. So the thing which they are attacking needs attacking. However, the side effect of it, as you've just said there, is, is this idea that it, you can't be intellectually credible and interested in the depths of ancient wisdom or the de depths of your own um, nature's soul. This, these are, even to use that word is immediately you're no longer intellectually credible. So I'm really, really, really pleased to see a, a renewed interest in depth and my whole hope is that we can develop, I want to get it to the place where people can stand up and say things which, sat, which, which are things like, look, I actually think that death is not the end of this experience I'm having of psyche. I don't. And I want to be able to say that and not sound like a woo-woo idiot who's just bought into a lot of uh, superstitious myths, and, but actually has got something to say, for instance. And I think we, if we can move in that direction, I, w I want to see a rational... Science, you know, in general terms, came in, that whole movement in, hi in, in history, to question and replace irrational religion. Now we want the other end of that dialectic is to replace it with rational spirituality. And if what's happening now with greater nuance and depth and long form discussions can lead to that, I think that's, that's the next evolutionary step. So this is an interesting term of a kind of rational spirituality. How does that differ to an irrational spirituality? What are the key differences for you? Well, first of all, I'm not against a little bit of irrationality. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I love to step out into, well, not knowing, which is not irrational, but irrational, not knowing, for me, is the foundation of everything. So the place we have to start and finish is, oh my God, what, you know, this is, we're in a breathtaking mystery that we exist. And the more we find out about it, the more profoundly mysterious it becomes. So there's, that humility is the place to start. I don't know. I've been alive now for almost 60 years. I've never met anyone who knows. I'm guessing that nobody knows. 
I don't even know what it would mean to know, actually, what that would mean. So there's this enormous, breathtaking mystery, and then we do our best to understand it, and we need to be open to everything, and doubt is our greatest ally in that. So that what's wrong with irrational spirituality is it doesn't have the doubt. It doesn't move on. It's based on a reverence for old ideas which have become established, written in old books. It doesn't question itself and therefore it's stuck. And, and people who believe it, if they don't question them, they're doing it unconsciously. Which is why most people are doing it with something they happen to be born in. What rationality does is, I mean, rationality, all it means is having a good reason. So if you think it's in the Bible is a good reason, then that's a good reason. I don't think that's a good reason. But what's really interesting as well is the idea, so the Bible, the books in the Bible were assembled over many centuries, millennia, and it sounds like a great idea. So take the best wisdom that you've got and make that into a way of living your life. But at some point someone says, okay, right, we're done. This is it. The Bible is finished. No one's ever going to come up with any other new ideas that need to be in this book. And that, that for me sounds peculiar. Like when you understand that the Bible was accreted over many years, it sounds like, wow, that w there's, a lot of, there's got to be a lot of accumulated wisdom in there. But at what point do you say, right, nothing more we need to know, we just need to live by these rules? Exactly. And, and the whole, I mean, you know, obviously you're, you're aware of the beautifully circular kind of literalist view of the Bible where it's like, I know it's true because it's in the Bible. How do you know it's true? Because the Bible says the Bible is true. And you're just going vroom, vroom, vroom around in a circle. So, and that has to be a historical. You, you, the whole collapse of uh, the literalist view of Christianity came through Protestant Reformation leading to the study of the Bible, which no one had done. And then you had an historical appreciation of it, and then it's no longer the revealed word of God. And then it's up for question. And then you start learning the history of it, and it's not a great history. And the people that have been involved in it are not the sort of people that you want to trust. Really, and I talked before about this kind of intellectual awakening that a lot of people are kind of recognizing. Is this something that you've encountered? Do you feel that you've been stimulated by stuff you've been seeing online recently? Well, I was stimulated by the documentary you made with Jordan Peterson. I mean, that, that's been the most obvious example for me where there's been this phenomena happen. And my entry point from, was somebody sending me videos, but for the first one was the, the one you made, which I thought was excellent. And I saw that this was deeply questioning. Seeing again, seeing Jordan on the news was astonishing for me. Half an hour with an intellectual being questioned. It was like, wow, this doesn't happen. I mean, I can't think of a phenomenon like it. Maybe Bertrand Russell um, uh, in my lifetime. I mean, just about in my lifetime. Um, um, but not since. I, it, and so Sam Harris, of course, and all that. So there is a definite, I, I, like most people, when I came to communicate my ideas, the people in the know are telling me, oh, you need to make it short, snappy, sound bites, simple. And I'm quite up for simple, as long as it's not too simple. It's not simplistic. It's like Albert Einstein said very famously, you know, as simple as possible, but no simpler. And that's a, a good mantra. But actually, turns out people are want content, want depth. So that I'm finding people are responding to uh, real conversation, which is what I've loved always. That's what I spent my life doing. So that suddenly there's a chance to have real conversation with people like yourself. And there's a lot of people who are going, oh yes, please. I think that's a sig really significant, I mean, how wide that spreads, we'll see. But the, the, the John Peterson effect has been so out of the blue, really. I, I mean, I admire you for seeing it coming, because I certainly didn't see it coming. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we're sort of very, we want to make sure that our channel is not just kind of Jordan Peterson only, yeah, of course. but it's such a useful window and lens to start looking at what's going on in the culture. And obviously yeah. the, the expansion into the intellectual dark web and other people riding the same wave that Jordan Peterson talks about. Um, and I know that you, you've written quite a lot about Gnosticism in the past. And one of the things that got us quite a lot of pushback was in that first Jordan Peterson documentary, uh, we mentioned Gnosticism, and a lot of people didn't like that. Do you, what, can you explain what Gnosticism is, firstly, and why it's always been like this controversial thing within Christianity? So Gnosticism, 
is a general term for a whole wide range of sects in the ancient world who were very, very different, actually. What linked them together was that their idea of Christianity was based around the experience of gnosis, which is knowing, a deep mystical knowing, knowing of oneself and knowing of God, which turns out to be the same thing. So, that, so they're, they're about knowledge, whereas traditional literalist Roman Christianity, which is what we're really talking about, the, the religion of the Roman Empire, is about belief, pistis, gnosis and pistis. So they are, they are rivals in the first centuries for the soul of Christianity. The version taught by the Roman Empire, which has been embraced pretty much unquestioned until recently, is that the Gnostics were heretics who kind of went pagan and got confused and are therefore dangerous and will lead you astray. The truth, in my own opinion, from my own studies, is the opposite, that the Gnostics are the original Christians who were then literalized into a cult which became part of the Roman Empire and then destroyed everything, the pagan world, the Jewish world indeed as well, and, and, and ancient Gnosticism. And there's always been this battle then between this established religion of an empire and this rebel undercurrent, which is about not priests and bishops, but you knowing for yourself through a direct experience of Gnosis. And we, um, we both worked on this particular line in the documentary, but we kind of suggested that he, he had a Gnostic, that Jordan Peterson had a more Gnostic understanding of Christianity. And a lot of people really pushed back on that. They really didn't like yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, why, why Jordan has got a more Gnostic appreciation of it, from what I understand of him, is that he's a myth mythologist. That the thing which marks out the Gnostic Christians is that they are looking at the Jesus story, and indeed the other stories, but the Jesus story as, an, as a spiritual allegory which leads to Gnosis. It's not about belief in an actual historical event, about a real man. It's that rather he is an everyman character, as, as Jung, who of course himself was a Gnostic and wrote The Seven Servants of the Dead in the name of a Gnostic teacher, Basilides, and bought the Gnostic manuscripts, which is why we have them, is that, that, that Jesus is an archetype of the self. So that they were seeing the Jesus story right from the birth in the cave to the empty cave at the end as an allegory about one's own spiritual journey through stages of initiation to this awakening. That's not what I was taught at Sunday school. And because of that mismatch, that's why people are very wary of the Gnostics. And something I've always found fascinating and a bit confusing um, talking to, to Christian friends is that they often say that it is the literal physical resurrection of Jesus that is at the core of at least that form of literalist Christianity. And without it, the whole thing kind of falls apart. Why, why is that? Yeah, why is that? It's because, um, you know, the, the strange thing is you know, that only makes sense if you have a literal Adam and Eve and a literal fall, because the whole mythology is that it's a, it's a redemption for that fall. Um, so if you really go down the literalist road and you're willing to believe that everything was created in seven days and Adam and Eve and all the rest of it, then you do need a literal Jesus. But if you understand that as mythology, then you can understand Jesus as mythology. It's just a big jump. People feel they're losing something. You know, if, when they read my, you know, or come across my ideas and, and it's like, oh, you, don't, you think that Jesus is a myth. It's like, oh, the, the, the truth, however, is the opposite. What strikes me is that Everyone has their own Jesus. You know, you speak to a fundamentalist and Jesus is a you know, fire and brimstone. You talk to a nice Quaker and Jesus is a pacifist. You talk to a Muslim and Jesus is a prophet like Muhammad, but just not quite as good. And, you know, or he's, you know, everyone's got their own Jesus and he's just like them. Now, if there was an historical Jesus, most people must accept that their Jesus is, is, is not the real one and that they're, they're having a relationship with a fantasy which is terribly sad. On the other hand, if you understand that the figure is designed to be a representation of your own deeper self, it's exactly right you should have your own Jesus. I have my own Jesus. Jesus is in my life. It's just not, it's not a literal man. It's a, it's a mask of God, like Joseph Campbell said. So it, it, it's something which you reach through, just in the same way that you know, I don't think most people 
certainly in the West, would see there was a literal Krishna or a literal Vishnu or a little Rama, mm. but in the same way, or indeed the ancient gods, the Dionysus or Osiris. So do you think Jesus really existed? No. No, I think the evidence, personally, it really, really points. There's three, there's three prongs to that, really. I mean, I certainly didn't set out with that. I mean, I, when I started work on the Gnostics, I, I assumed there was a real Jesus. I almost became a friar when I was younger, you know, brought up in the Church of England and, and very nearly joined the church. Um, but eventually, with the research, there seemed to be three things. One was um, the incredible similarities between ancient pagan mythology and what became the Jesus story. And seeing that in, that in, in these ancient pagan myths of a son of God or a God-man, were all the motifs. Now, people attack that because there's no, there's no ancient story which is the same. It's not, like a, it's not just copied. But it's more like you, you would get in film today or in, you know, if you took, I don't know, The Matrix, you could probably go, oh, look, he's taken that from there and that's come from there and, that's, and from it's created a whole new thing. That's not the Jesus story. It's just taken all these motifs um, so that just about every single thing, probably everything, actually, that makes up the Jesus story as a narrative is already there in the ancient world. Uh, so there's that, so it resembles pagan myths. There's the fact that the earliest Christians don't deny this. They're, you get Justin Martyr, who actually it makes a virtue of it, the, the similarities. So they're not, it, it, why it's a shock today when people realize it's the same as pagan mythology, it, it wasn't then, it was obvious then. So that's the one kind of part of it. And then there are the others, the Gnostics, which is, here is a group of people who predate actually the idea of year zero because there is no year zero. So they've been around for, and they're studying the myths of the, the Jewish mythology and, and that as an allegory, Exodus in particular. They're around Alexandria where I think all of this is being written, which is like the New York of the ancient world. Big Jewish community, all speaking Greek, which is the English of the ancient world. And they are uh, writing all these documents in, in Greek, and we have loads of them, which are called intertestamental texts, and they're a combination of Jewish mythology and pagan mythology. And then at the end of them comes this other, these other texts, these Gnostic texts, which I think well, they're all Gnostic, which have this amazing story of the, of the Redeemer, which are very similar to pagan myths, and they themselves are a mixture of pagan and Jewish mythology, and it just feels a natural continuation. And they see it as their great heresy for which they were put down is Jesus never came in the flesh. He comes in you. So that's the two. And then the, th the third thing is there is no evidence for an historical man. None. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the only things which are held up, like this little passage in the Jewish historian Josephus, is, I mean, any, any scholar of their soul knows it's a fake. It's the, the language is wrong. It's been added later. It's, and it shows just how they were desperate to find some, something which they could hang this around. So it's not important to me, really, whether there was or wasn't a historical Jesus. I'm more, more interested in what the myth means, but I don't think there was. There was another uh, part to that myth, my understanding, which integrated uh, Sophia, so a kind of divine feminine archetype, which seems very missing from Christianity otherwise. Um, so what, what was Sophia to the Gnostics? Yeah, isn't that, I mean, isn't that amazing? There was a Christian goddess. I mean, isn't that, I mean, I was just so excited when we started getting into that. And as a philosopher, a philo Sophia, a lover of Sophia, it's like, oh, right, cool. So she gets called, she's got lots of names. Sophia's just one. Um, the pagan mythology, I think, has taken, that comes into Christianity in, the, in the, its original Gnostic form as a quaternity. I think there is father and son, and mother and daughter. And they represent, uh, in the mythology, they, uh, the, the, the male archetype is, is the source, the mystery, the unseen. The, that's God. God is the source, the potentiality for everything. And the goddess is all a form. The, the, probably the easiest understanding of that is Nuit in the Egyptian tradition, the night sky. She is the whole universe and everything within it. That's the canopy. And through the canopy are, are holes, the stars, where the light beyond, which is the male principle, shines. And, and then she, so we're in her now. She is all the forms. She is soul, psyche, form. And, and then it, that individuates. So now there's the sun, which is that potentiality, that pure being, 
consciousness, but in you and in me. So that's our, ind and that's the sun. And then the daughter is our soul. It's our particular fragment of the world soul or the cosmic soul. And so the job of redemption, so the, Gnost the Gnostic myth is one of the fall. And, and so Sophia, which is everyone's soul, not men and women, falling into matter, getting lost, looking for love, looking for the light, and looking in all the wrong places, becoming abused and having a very hard time, lots of suffering, and then turning around and calling back to her father, help me. And then the male principal sends the son to rescue her. And he's her brother, stroke, lover, as you're only allowed to be in myths. <laughs> and comes down, and, and that's the Jesus figure. And in the Jesus story, you get the two, you get the Virgin Mary at the mouth of the cave, the, the stable, but actually it's cave in the Greek. So she's at the mouth of the cave, and she's the goddess of justice who brings, uh, she's on the left hand, of the left hand path, which brings souls in and out of incarnation. Jesus is going to sit on the right hand, which leads people away from that. But she's recycling souls, and Jesus comes in, and he's the perfect initiate, goes through his life. And then, and then, and then part of that is the meeting the other Mary, who's the fallen woman. That's Sophia. I mean, that's taken directly from the Sophia myth. And he takes out seven demons. Well, the place where people will be most aware of those seven levels now is the Indian chakras. But actually, it's also there in the, in the pagan mythology and, and Mithraism particularly. So he's, he's taking her through these different levels of purification, and then she, what she, she then becomes the what she becomes Sophia. She becomes the wise woman, and then in the Gnostic literature, after his death, it is Mary Magdalene who teaches the secret teachings to the 12 disciples. Because the 12 men are the, the signs of the zodiac. So Jesus is the still point in the middle, and they dance around him, literally dance in, in one of the documents. They dance around him, and they are the 12 signs. We're on the wheel, the wheel of suffering, or in the, in the, in the pagan version, it's the wheel of grief. Pythagoras calls it the wheel of grief. It's the same as the Indian thing. So we're stuck on the wheel, and, and she reveals the wisdom to how to find the center. And so she's the dis she still, by the Catholic Church, she is still called the disciple to the disciples. So quite important. And, and really interesting, if you go back to the Gnostic literature, one of the great things they're condemned for, which is really interesting, is that well, they're Pythagoreans, really, so they treat women really well. And, and uh, of, there's a guy called Celsus who writes a, about attacking the Gnostics, and every gospel he mentions, just about, is accredited to a woman. And they're great, you know, they have women priests, and the church is very upset about the whole thing. But it's kind of interesting today, from our point of view, to look back and go, oh, that's much more like us. Why do you think this is relevant, or why do you think that, um, why is this important now? I think, for me, the going back with Christianity, which is, you know, my early work 20 years ago, is a bit like psychotherapy. It's a bit like, our culturally, we need to go back. There's a, there's a schism in the Western soul between our pagan roots and our Christian roots. And we've been told that they're, they're enemies, and they're not. They're exactly the same thing. Christianity is paganism. There's just one evolutionary current in the West. Of course, how could there be otherwise? And that, and I think there's, there's a great healing that can happen with that. And I also think it, the return to the Gnostic spirit, which has been so prevalent since the 60s, is a return to self, um, the, the individual journey of, of self-inquiry. And do you think that's become more popular because of the kind of spiritual technologies we have, the, the psychedelics, the, in, the internal experience of the divine that a lot of people have had have led to a re revival of Gnosticism? Wow, that's really interesting. I mean, certainly psychedelics, I think, had, did play a big role. Um, so many different currents. Also, you know, we brought in a lot of the Eastern wisdom which had kept those currents alive because they hadn't gone through the same level of individuation that we did. They missed that, but, and they suffered for it. But they benefited by keeping that other current alive, so it looked very attractive to us. So we could go across to, to Asia and just go, whoa, well, you've got the inner mystery still. And then, and that's what I did. Most of my early books are on Eastern spirituality. And then looking at the Gnostics and going, oh my God, it's, it's right here in our Western tradition. And it heals that divide. So for me, it's, 
I'm more interested in how we take it forward, but I think there's something very healing about it. And there's something which enables us to choose a different path. You know, when, when we were at the Jesus Mysteries, so 99, was the beginning of a lot of attacks on religion, and rightfully so, in my view, too. But our book is dedicated to the Christ in you. It's not coming from an atheistic, condemn, it's all a waste of time viewpoint. It's going, let's see it differently. And I think that's a, that's a much more um, healthy option than just dismiss it, we're now into science, that's all rubbish, mythological mumbo jumbo. It's actually going, no, 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 we need all of it. This is all part of the human experience and, it's, and it's all, there's value in it, huge value actually. Can you talk a bit more of that it's a really interesting uh, metaphor talking about sort of psychotherapy for the split yeah. in the Western soul? Can you explain more about what that means and what it is that we've split off from and what we need to, what the he that healing looks like? Yeah, I, I think we set, up, we set up an opposition a long time ago and then with the triumph of literature... Do you think this maps onto, say, Ian McGilchrist's work about the left brain and the right brain and... Ooh. Because um, he, he argues that the left brain has effectively been at war with the right brain. The left brain being, being more particular, being more uh, rational, and the right brain having an, a, a kind of more open to the oneness experience and sort of the sense of unity with all things. And I, I, I really admire Ian's work. Um, I think he's an extraordinary man. I'm not completely sure about that version of history. Um, it feels to me that we, we didn't, we, there wasn't some place where we were all in the oneness and open to that and then the, the, the rational left brain took over and then we lost it. I think that both have always been present and, and that the ancient world doesn't look particularly awake to me. It looks full of suffering and short, brutal lives, really, um, unless you happen to be an aristocrat, in which case it was, you, know, you could sit around and do philosophy. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't feel like, oh, we had it and then we lost it. it do, if, to me, I mean, some things we did, but it's, to me it's more of an evolutionary current where we had that and then it particularised. And, and something Jung talks about with Christianity is it, it, it's, it was part of an individuation process by kind of narrowing it down. This one man who saved everything was in some way part of this thing which happened in the West which has led to us, where we're compared to our ancestors, highly individuated, very particular. We're, we don't, you know, we're not all wearing the same things anymore. We're not, we, there's variation, huge variation, thinking in different ways. And, and we've had that in a way that didn't happen in the ancient world and certainly and didn't happen in the East so much. So that you see this break where that starts to happen with the triumph of Christianity and this monotheistic hold it has on the Western world. And then the ancient soul comes back with the Renaissance and you get the discovery of the, the ancient texts, the Hermetica, the, the um, Platonic texts, and you see the birth of this incredible awakening, very much like now, I think, this extraordinary awakening in the arts and in the in, in intelligence and in, 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 in scholarly studies of the past, and it starts what's going to become science. So. That current coming back in, now we, we can see how it, that has all happened. Then it feels like we can integrate, we, it's going to help us integrate our past. And the whole point for doing that is to go forward, is to feel that like we don't have to get now stuck in this rather fallen, limited, reductionist science where we've ended up, which is phenomenal on the one hand. I mean, I have so much respect for its achievements. It's unbelievable what it's done and is philosophically pretty impoverished and is, is literally soul-destroying, literally has taken this experience we're having right now of the psyche, the soul, and gone, it's a kind of an illusion created by a piece of meat and of no significance whatsoever, really. And that reductionism is so damaging to the heart and to the soul. So if we can integrate all of that together, then maybe we can step forward into something which goes, look, there's value in all of that. There's a, there seems to be another beautiful cycle there of when things become uh, unmovable in our culture, we look into the ancient past. And a few people we've spoken to have said exactly that. So 
what do you think is the way, to, or what's your particular way of doing that? Because there's a lot in the past, and I suppose selecting what's needed for right now, selecting the right wisdom, is quite important. So what are some of the ways you think we can start using ancient wisdom to start moving forward in the society? You know what, I mean, I've been embedded in it for so long, so many decades, it's kind of, it's just in me now. And so you know, my actual response to your question is the danger I think now is the opposite. Mm -hmm. I, what I see is romanticization of the past. And I, a, a kind of a, a, a way of, oh, we had it then and we lost it. Mm -hmm. Or, oh, the people who are still living in the jungles, they've got it and we haven't got it. And it just feels like, look, there is something which we lose. You, you always lose something when you gain something. And there's something which um, cultures that live in very different ways have that we don't have. That's for sure. But I'm really, really careful of this romanticization of it, as if somehow we need to get back to something. I don't think we do. I think we need to keep going with the evolutionary current. Just, just we're, we're, doing, we're doing fine. You know, it's re we, we've arrived at an amazing place, quite astonishing where we are. And we're in better shape than we've ever been. And we just need to keep going and, and, and integrate the thing which is, which is missing. And right now what is missing is, well, the, the reductionist thing is the problem because that takes everything and pulls it down to the, the most basic level. And what excites me in my latest work is that this emergentist view that's arriving with an evolutionary understanding, which says the opposite to reduction, which goes, no, don't reduce everything to its components. Actually see that greater and greater holes are emerging. Greater, there's creativity to the whole process of the, of the universe. So you've got that literally in the construction of the physical universe and the biological universe and I think also the universe of the soul, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about the history of Western ideas. So um, I find that really interesting, this idea of um, a model of reality that is somehow inherently evolutionary and it's always going to some kind of greater whole. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that and what that means to you? <laughs> yeah, I'd be delighted to. This is my real passion. Um, my latest work, which I think is my best in a book called Soul Story, is really trying to lay out an emergentist spiritual philosophy. And the basic, the basic thesis comes from my technique as a philosopher is to look at the moment, because that's what I've got. So look, what, what's this, what's this, what's this? So what I see when I look at the moment is a flow of experiences. So what seems to be real is time despite the people that constantly tell me that it's an illusion, I don't really know what that means because what I see is every moment is this flow of time. So I started looking at the flow of time and it felt like, ah, it, what, what, the qualities that it has it, 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 is that every moment is, a, is realizing a new potentiality. Like this one is new and new and new and no two moments are ever the same. These are obvious things, but I'm fascinated by the obvious. And that every moment also contains within it implicitly everything that's happened before. So it feels like, ah, oh, that's interesting. So, so that we have this idea in English that the past passes, but it hasn't passed. It's actually right here. It's the, the, the time actually doesn't pass. The past accumulates. There's just more past and more past and more past. And it's all present implicitly in the moment. And that each moment has this quality of being a new, realizing a new possibility and containing everything that's been before. So like the moment is made of the past coexisting with the possible. And that feels to me a description of the fundamental nature of what reality is. So that what we're seeing 13.8 billion years ago, if the dates are right, is the start for our universe of a process of the realization of potentiality. And as the past accumulates, as there's more and more of it, there is a richness and complexity which tends towards what we call evolution and tends towards the emergence of novelty. So that there's a, that, to use a lovely line, which is from Brian Swim, the evolutionary uh, philosopher who I loved a bit, um, who said something like, you know, what have we learned? We've learned that if you take hydrogen and you wait long enough, it learns to sing opera which I think is just spectacular, because that's what we've learned. It's like you take hydrogen and it will emerge eventually as you and me. And, and what I see in that, 
and my attempt to integrate science with, with the spiritual tradition is to go, look, well, in, this idea of evolution arose with biology, with Darwin and Wallace, and that, uh, the whole idea that every, this huge variety of life came from one simple source. What an astonishing idea that is. I mean, just, wow. I mean, and everything seems to point towards that being right. And then, what, 100 years ago, we got the idea that, no, it wasn't just biology that had evolved. The whole of the, the universe had evolved. I mean, and I, that's uns that is a mythos of such grandeur. I mean, this is why I say we're on, we're on track, guys. I mean, these, this leaves ancient myths just like, yeah, whatever. I mean, this is big stuff now. So we've got, the, we've got this 10 billion years of the evolution of the physical cosmos. Then you've got the 3 billion years of, of the evolution of life. And then right at the end of that, you've got the evolution of psyche which is Greek for soul. It's what the, the Gnostics, it's a Gnostic word, and it means the soul. And what it's pointing to, what they're pointing to, what the word refers to, is this experience you and I are having now of a non-material reality. And we're in it right now. Our bodies are sitting here, mine's doing its you know, things, you're listening and nodding. That's what our bodies are doing, and all the actions in a non-material realm. And all the meaning, isn't it, is in that non-material realm. In, in the physical realm, there's a monkey making funny noises. But in the non-material realm, we are sharing meaning. That's the latest thing. So the whole evolutionary process has gone from basic matter to something not made of matter, made of images. What the reductionists do is they reduce everything to what's come before until really it's just atoms, or even lower than that. What the emergentists do is they go, no, 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 it's reality emerging on ever more at deeper levels, more emergent levels. So the soul, the, the, the psyche, is not some byproduct of anything. It's a, it's a level of reality. Well, that's what spirituality says. You know, if you, I've just been to speaking at a psychedelic festival in Hungary, you know, it's like what people are exploring there is soul. And you can go off into it and there's, it's huge. There's worlds out there. It's what shamanic exploration, all the whole of spirituality is about that world the Duat for the ancient Egyptians, the imaginal realm of the Sufis, the Bardos, there's a thousand names, the astral plane, there's a, it's a dimension. So my thesis is, look, what spirituality does is it sees that as pre-existent. That's always been there, and we have fallen from it. That's a Gnostic myth. Mm. It's a bit very pessimistic. We fall into life, life is this awful thing, which you've got trapped in a body, and if you can just be spiritual enough, you can get out and you never have to come back. Because who would want to come back to here? What the emergentist thing says is, no, no, no. Actually, life is a beautiful thing. And it's emerging on ever deeper and more emergent levels. And it's emerged as, finally, this world of psyche. A world of the soul. A world in which, in my opinion, we can actually survive without the body. And which we can explore in great depth through spiritual practices. But not as something which has always been there, which unfortunately through some cosmic mess up we fell out of, but actually something which is emerging in an evolutionary current. So there's three phases of evolution. There's the physical, the biological, and then the soul phase. And then at the end of that, I think in this new phase is where you started, David, is the idea that what's coming now is this deeper awakening to this oneness with the very source that we're waking up to a fundamental oneness with where all of this has come from. And that's a whole new thing again. Feels to me to be a really good place to, to end. Felt like a really good wrap up. Yeah. yeah, it's a grand story. Yeah. Tim, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.